like you know like oh you're gonna turn it up next pass and like the, the fact of the matter is it's up every pass you know it's a 300 cubic inch factory casting engine going 227 like so you can't just put 10 pounds of boost in it it's gonna explode and catch on fire you know so it's not you know a hail mary is just dangerous so it's not even worth it Welcome to the HPA Tune-In Podcast, I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode we're joined by Brett LaSala, builder and driver of the aptly named bright green Ford Mustang, Snot Rocket. Brett joins us fresh off the back of an outright win at the 2024 Sick Week Drag and Drive event. If you haven't heard of Drag and Drive, this is kind of a bit of punishment for a drag car. Not only do you have to run incredibly quick passes down the quarter mile, you actually also have to compete at five different drag strips over a week and drive your drag car between them on the road. On top of this, you also have to tow around a trailer that includes all of your spares, all of your tools, basically everything that you need to work on and service your car. So it really steps up the challenge. Despite this, Brett's car averaged over the five days a 6.34 second pass at 227 mile an hour. His fastest ET is a 6.26, so this thing is no slouch. And... I'd argue, having come from a drag racing background myself, that the drag and drive events actually are more challenging than building an outright drag car. Making a, an engine that's producing three to 4,000 horsepower also drive a thousand miles across the normal road going streets is beyond difficult and really really is a testament to what Brett has built here. We talked to Brett about his background and how he got interested in cars, how he built up his fairly diverse skill set because he's able to work on just about every facet of this build himself. We talk about the development of the car, how he started with a basically a, a road going Mustang and then decided that in order to go much much faster he was going to to really have to cut up most of that car so he sold it and started again. We talk about the engine development and the turbo development which is so key to uh, getting performance out of any turbocharged drag engine. And in a world where everyone seems to be switching across to billet, we hear about the limitations of this Ford 5 litre V8 and where those limitations are, where the requirements for switching across from a cast to a billet block might be and why there's a few roadblocks in the way if Brett does want to go down that path. Before we get into our interview, for those who are new to the HPA Tuned In podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialise in teaching people about performance engine building, EFI tuning. We also cover designing and constructing wiring harnesses, race driver education, race car setup, 3D modelling and CAD, just to name a few of our topics. You can find all of our courses at hpacanary.com forward slash courses. All of our courses are delivered by high definition video modules that you can take from anywhere in the world provided you've got an internet connection. This gives you the benefit of being able to learn from the comfort of your own place and you can learn at your own pace. All of our courses also come with a 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee so if you purchase and for any reason at all decide it just isn't quite right for you, no problem, let us know, we'll give you a full refund of the purchase price. And as a podcast listener you can use the coupon code PODCAST75, that'll get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course. We'll put a link to our courses and that coupon code in the show notes. Lastly, if you like free stuff, then I've got a great deal for you. If you head to hpacanary.com forward slash giveaway, that will show you the current giveaway that we've got running. We switch these up around about every month and we partner with some of the biggest names in the performance aftermarket industry. We might be giving away an aftermarket ECU or a power distribution module, maybe a dash, maybe some engine building tools, pistons, conrods, you name it, we've given it away. And we will ship free of charge to the door of whoever wins so don't think you're missing out just because you live on the opposite side of the world. Again you'll find a link to that page in the show notes. Enough of that introduction though let's get into our interview now. All right welcome to the podcast Brett thanks for joining us today and as we always do let's start by finding out a little bit about your background specifically how you developed an interest in cars. Yeah absolutely I think my interest in cars developed the same way a lot of us did you know, I was a kid, a young teenager, and my dad had a hot rod that he actually had since he was in high school. It was a 1970 Monte Carlo SS with a 454. It was a big 
four door car. Well, it was a two door. It was just a giant two door, the SS version of that Monte Carlo. And the car was on blocks like most of my childhood. I never actually ran and drive much when I was a kid. It was in an accident. I think my mom was driving it and it got hit. And then, you know, they just parked it and it started rusting away. And then I think maybe he got the urge or he, I, you know, he saw my interest in it because, you know, he grew up, you know, riding dirt bikes, four wheelers. It was kind of deal like we had the mow the lawn, but you had to get the mower running in order to mow the lawn because it was an older lawn mower. So, you know, you kind of got a mechanical sense naturally because you had to. There was a 77 Camaro parked down the street from us, which was like in a similar condition as his Monte Carlo. And he ended up trading, I believe, like a washer machine for the car. And it was, you know, it didn't have an engine. And then that was our project. We put the 454 into that car. And my dad doesn't have a real mechanical background other than very hobby level. And so, you know, we learned together and, you know, I started getting into it. And if I wanted to know something on the car, you know, I would buy a, a book. And, you know, like I bought a carburetor book and I learned how to tune the carburetor. We bought a transmission book and we got the Turbo 400 working well. It really got my attention. And then moving into high school, you know, that was all I could think about. And when I was 16, my, my uncle owned a transmission shop down in South Florida. And he had a 85 Trans Am that someone had brought in for repair, couldn't pay the diagnostic bill and ended up leaving him the car. So he gave that to me as my first car. So I could get it running and then that I could have a car. Yeah, right. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Right, right. A great deal. So I got the car running. You know, I had a 305 with an electronic carburetor. It was a, it was a horrible engine and a horrible time for, for that platform. But, you know, I, I had my first car and it kind of escalated from that point on. In high school, I got a, I got a Fox Body Mustang and that was my first switch over to the Ford platform. So, you know, my dad had the, the 454 Monte Carlo. We built a Camaro. I had the Trans Am. I was in the market for a Camaro because that was, you know, you, you kind of grow up the brand that. Yeah, I was going to I was going to say normally you're a GM guy for life or a Ford guy for life. There's not too many I wouldn't think that sort of switch codes halfway through. Right, right, right. So I think I had a pickup truck or two throughout that time. But, you know, I was in the market to make a little hot rod you know, 16, 17 years old, probably 17 at that time. So I was working in an automotive shop. So I was taking auto tech in high school because I was already hooked into cars at that point. And when I was 16, I got a job at the Mining Key Muffler. It was a local auto repair shop in my town. They were the only shop in town that would hire me because I wasn't 18, so I couldn't be on the insurance. So I would go after school and work at the shop. So then, you know, I had a job, so I was making a little bit of money. And the Camaros at the time, were around five thousand dollars. Yeah, so so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so expensive, right? So I didn't have enough money for that car. And at the same time, my next door neighbor, he had a nineteen ninety Ford Mustang GT. And, you know, he was the original owner of it. And he said, Well I'll sell you this car for three thousand. I had that it was how much money I had. And I bought that car and like needless to say, that was the um the beginning of the end for me with Chevrolet. So that was uh uh, you know, my switch over to Ford was just basically I could afford the Mustang. I couldn't afford the Camaro. And I started hot rodding that Mustang in high school. And before you know it, it was pretty quick. Like, you know, it had a, a bunch of nitrous on it, ran low 11s, like really stock engine, you know, and, and that was kind of it on that. Uh, I'm, I'm interested, where did the, the sort of passion for drag racing, which is obviously why we've we've got you on the podcast, where did that passion for drag racing sort of come from? Because again, just like the sort of the Ford versus GM path, people tend to either go down the route of drag racing or road racing. Right. You know, I, I never really thought about that much, but I would say that just came from high school because, you know, all the you know, the car guys would hang out together and early outs, we would go to the um, old abandoned like neighborhood and drag race. So, you know, all of our very slow cars, we would drag race. So then at that point, I guess drag racing was, was just it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think for me as well, one of the reasons I really like drag racing is it's uh, an international comparison that you don't get. You know, I talk about a, a lap time from a racetrack here in New Zealand and obviously no one except people have been to that racetrack. It's just it's meaningless. Whereas you say, you know, I ran a six two. Well, doesn't matter where in the world you are, a six two is a six two because that thirteen twenty feet drag strip is always the same. So yeah, I, I think that's that's helpful. But the other element is that 
As a tuner and an engine builder myself, I kind of found that the drag strip was a really good way of, of seeing how good my work was because the ET and mile an hour don't lie, whereas you can put a car on a dyno and within reason just about get any number you want for bragging rights, but that doesn't really mean a lot when the uh, the tree goes green. Absolutely. All right, so uh, looking at your actual sort of automotive skill set, it sounds like you've built this up quite quickly through high school, uh, auto tech, and, and then these jobs. Have you got at the stage formal qualifications in an automotive sense? Uh, yeah, so basically at the end of high school, so, you know, I was already working in a shop pretty much full time. I had, you know, half the day because uh, of the vocational classes I was taking, I had you know, I could leave school early and, and I was working in, in the shop and the high school came to an end and, it, you know, people were going to college and things like that. And at that point, I didn't even think about it. I was racing my car, working in the shop, working on my car at night. But at that time, I was already working with a guy who, who had a hot rod shop at his house. So, you know, I would I would go to school, I would go to the repair shop and then I would go to Frank's house and, you know, he was building race cars. And then I would start to pick up, you know, on race car things there from someone that was already doing it at a higher level than I was. So at that point, it was like, yeah, I'm going to work on cars. So, you know, high school ended and I, and I started working on cars full time at that shop. Some years passed and then I realized that, you know, I needed to make a better income than I was making at that repair shop. And I went to work for Mercedes Benz. The dealership was a couple doors down from the repair shop I was at. And I realized if I was going to be a technician, if I can get into this dealership, you know, it was going to be the most lucrative repair position I could, I could make working on cars. And it turns out that worked out very well for me. I worked for Mercedes Benz for 15 years up until when I went to work for Real Street just in 2021, I believe it was. Uh, you know, and I worked my way up, you know, with Mercedes. I was a master tech, CDT, team leader. The amount of new technology that was always coming out from that brand because they're they're ahead of all the other brands they just don't advertise it you know and the training that we had access to as techs was pretty much unlimited you just had to pursue it yourself so that really was what what drove me as far as backgrounds understanding you know engines diagnostic electrical and then the motorsports aspect was just still uh, my hobby um, after work kind of thing. Okay. I'm actually interested to dive into that position with Mercedes-Benz a little deeper because we don't often get to talk to people on the podcast who have that franchise dealership background. I, I've sort of seen this transition with a lot of mechanics from the old school where you know physically they'd be rebuilding engines, replacing piston rings, you know, setting valve lash, etc. And I, I might be off the mark here, I see the more modern vehicles now, there's not a lot of actual hands-on maintenance being done on the engine so much. You know, We've gone away from cam belts to cam chains. You know, it, does it become more of a, of a diagnostic task on these very modern vehicles as opposed to actually spinning spanners or is there still a, a fair element of mechanical work as well uh, i say it's a good i say it's a good mix um, there's still a lot of mechanical work and we're still repairing engines because from the warranty aspect the outcome the repair order needs to be repaired at the least expense possible to the warranty job so you know with mercedes-benz their engines as a package were very expensive some of them cost as much as the vehicle does so you know there was multiple times we we're putting a crankcase in or a set of pistons in but the mechanical aspect of these cars are getting better to where there's more electronic systems than there are mechanical systems. So a lot of times the cars comes in, it's more for a diagnostic type repair than a mechanical type repair. And when the mechanical things tend to happen, they're able to track them so closely because of the machineries and the way that the cars are manufactured that they know they can group a VIN number in like, okay, we had this issue starting at this engine serial number and to this engine serial number. So you know, then a bulletin or something would be released and then the technician would kind of know what to look for when it came to that. Takes a lot of the guesswork out of the diagnostics. Yeah, and the dealership that I worked for in Tampa was one of the, the highest volume dealerships in the country. So we, we saw uh, a lot of the problems before any other dealership saw them. And we were also one of the highest AMG selling dealerships, the performance side of Mercedes in the country. And me with my natural motorsports uh, curiosity and engine curiosity, you know, I was that guy. So if there was, you know, any engine work in the shop, more than likely it ended up shifting around and coming to me to either diagnose or or be hands on. And the same thing with the AMG and the performance line. And I got to work with the Mercedes factory level engineers and stuff on new problems. So, you know, it was I got to do it at a higher level than the 
than a, a standard. So it was really neat for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like you've got a, a very thorough grounding in mechanical work and the electronic side of things. Uh, have you got any other skill sets you sort of bring to the table? Fabrication, for example? So fabrication, I learned as I went and mainly from my friend, Jim Braun. You know, he's my right hand man in a sense with the car. Me and him have been friends since I moved to the Tampa area in 2015, starting with my old car and his car. He still has his car. It's going under redition right now, getting more roll cage and a mini tub to be safer for the speeds that it's going to go. But, uh, you know, he was the fabricator. He's a, he's a genius and a visionary when it comes to it. I knew how the system needed to be made, you know, the piping sizing, uh, how it needed to be routed. One of the things that I feel like I learned a lot from the from the dealership was, you know, all we worked on were failed cars as a technician. You know, you didn't really get to see a lot of the good cars. They were getting oil changes and going back out the door. So you got to, you know, see a lot of failure points and why they're happening when it came to wiring or hose routing or heat protection or, or things like that. So, you know, I feel like that's transferred into the race cars and into the modified cars because, you know, a lot of people those put pipes and things because it looks pretty. Or, you know, just because it goes there, but it's, it's not going to last like it needs to last. Then the flip side of that is I still want it to look very good and be serviceable. So one of my main things when we build a car like mine is like, I know I'm going to have to take the engine out. I know I'm going to have to take the turbo kit off. Like, so, you know, we build things in a sense where there's not things in the way or there's less steps uh, that need to be taken to access certain things. I think you don't get into that mentality until you're actually working on these cars hands-on all the time and you very quickly realise where the sort of pain points are if you like and a classic example of where I absolutely got this wrong was my old Evo drag car. We cut the front end off that and and tube framed it and um, Jono, the friend of mine who did all of that, did an amazing job. However, what we didn't think through was how easy or difficult it was going to be to remove the gearbox out of that, which was the weak point. To hold the drivetrain and that together, we had to slip the clutch so heavily off the line that you'd get 10 passes out of a triple plate clutch and it was was rinsed. So basically, every drag meeting, the gearbox had to come out. Problem was, the way the front end was designed, you couldn't get the gearbox out independent of the engine. So it was an absolute major. Moving on from that, we kind of learned from our mistakes. We built a, an Evo 9 drag car for a customer. We custom built the subframe for that. So it became something like a 15 minute job to drop the gearbox. It's just super easy. So yeah, you, you live and learn. You, get, you, you sort of build up those experiences and know what not to do. I also totally agree with thinking things through in terms of where they're mounted so that makes sense. Heat management is something that's really, really easy to overlook. And also you can have, I think, form and function can work together. You can build a car that works great and also looks great, which is exactly what what you've done. Before we get into the car, I feel like we sort of just need to quickly touch on the rest of your sort of working career. You mentioned Real Street. We've had Jay on the podcast before, so he's a, he's a friend of HPA as well. Always looked up to Real Street. What was your position there and what were you doing? Uh, my position there was I was the workshop lead. So Real Street, you know, its main part business is, or its main business is parts resale. They, uh, you know, sell parts wholesale and retail. And, you know, that's where the income comes from. But we also had a workshop there where cars were getting worked on for either media or parts testing, you know, tuning, things like that, you know, not for customers, but they were mostly real street owned cars or personal cars, you know, used to promote the parts business. So when I got I met Jay 2019 during drag week with my with my older car. I had an issue with the AEM having a camp sync failure. He happened to be in the area at the time and he came over and, you know, was was looking at it and calling some friends of his at AEM to see if we can get it sorted because we were actually on the last day. And, you know, we were in the battle for first place for the small block power adder class for an A50 index class. And my car couldn't make a lap. So he was helping me trying to get that sorted to make a pass. And after that, you know, that day he told me to switch the car over to a Motec. And I was like, yeah, that sounds easy, but it's not that easy. And uh, over the next year, he showed me that it isn't that difficult, you know, that maybe it just had a, a I had a mental block on it, thinking that it was going to be worse than it was. And then he would tune my car. So I did. Uh, Jim also did it with me. We both switched our cars over the Motec. Jay started tuning them for us. 
And, you know, we started having more successful outings with the cars and we were at a race or we might've been at a dyno one time with my car. And, you know, he's like, well, why don't you come work for me? And I was like, yeah, that's, that's great. I would, I would love to, but you know, I have a really good position on what I do, um, making what I want to make. And I'm not sure that the aftermarket, you know, can support what I'm doing now. And turns out the position that he offered me was uh, better than I could have imagined it being. I went to work for him uh, over the course of the three years there. I was able to build this new car and to continue my knowledge now just in the aftermarket sense and take, you know, my factory training, my factory background. And now, you know, with a mind like his, learn the other aspect to building a race car or hot rod in general. And that's what's basically accelerated my career or myself or my program to where it is now. Yeah, well, I'm interested, do you think, given that obviously there's a lot of crossovers, but some very big differences between working on production cars and doing general service repair and maintenance to building a six second race car, how valuable has your experience at a franchise dealership been with building these cars? Uh, You know, I don't know exactly. Exactly, because maybe because I didn't do it the other way. I know that, you know, as far as like general service and maintenance goes, like I didn't do a lot of that at the dealership. A lot of that, you know, was done by other techs. You know, I was more diagnostic, electrical, you know, harder problem solving type vehicles or engine work or, or AMG work kind of thing there. And I was always basically every night, as soon as I, you know, went home from the dealership, I was working on a race car just at a, at a lower level, lower horsepower level, because, you know, we weren't there in our program yet. So for me, it was always just gaining knowledge and learning. Like that's my excitement to, to continue to grow, to find information, to apply it to what I'm doing, to look at other aspects when it comes to circuit race cars or how they're built and, you know, find inspiration in other motorsports to uh, apply it to drag racing. Okay. Yeah. Fair. All right. Let's uh, sort of get into the nitty gritty here with your cars or your current car specifically is what we really want to talk about but i guess before we dive into that give us a quick overview of what a drag and drive event is and what that actually entails so a drag and drive event there's a couple different versions of them now but uh mainly sick week and drag week has started off as a five-day event so there's five days five racetracks starts at one racetrack between each day you get a map a course and you have to drive that specific drive each day with your race vehicle to the next racetrack you can make as many passes as you want each day you hand in one time slip uh, whichever one you feel is the best of that day and then they take the average of the five time slips you hand in one each day and that is your overall et for the week and the vehicle you're not allowed to have a support vehicle. So if you need to carry stuff with you, you need to have a trailer and the trailer is regulated on size. You're not allowed to have any outside help on a day-to-day basis, only the crew that is with you in your car. So if you have one person, that's the only person that can help you with your car on a day-to-day. So you're not even allowed, you said no support vehicles, you're not even allowed other people following you around to, to help. You're limited essentially to one helper? Right, exactly. You know, so yeah, basically, yeah, one one helper is all you can get. Now, if you have a, a, a failure outside, it's something not planned for. So the one helper thing is your normal daily routine, what it takes to race your car. Now, say you have a failure outside of the, the normal spectrum, you're allowed to have a little bit of outside help from another racer or something like that for that instance. But you're not allowed to you're not allowed to tow the vehicle anywhere. It's pretty much like as it runs and drives, like that that's you for the week. I'm interested with this sort of event. What is the more challenging part? Doing the passes down the drag strip or the driving you know, hundreds of miles potentially between drag strips? Well, for me, uh, it's going to depend on the car. So the drag and drive event is, you know, for sick week, I believe there's 400 cars entered in that event. There's probably 10 cars that are going really fast that probably shouldn't be driven a thousand miles (laughs) in race five days, you know? So for those cars, the drive is definitely harder. You know, there's, you know, for the mass that's doing drag and drive, it's, uh, um, it's not like a typical drag event if someone hasn't been to one you got to go to experience hard to describe like it's just the camaraderie like you know people hanging out you get to the racetrack and and i remember my first drag week and you know the second racetrack we pull into and you look out into the pits and there's no semis there's no toters there's no there's no trucks it's just race cars doing race car things you know like like it kind of brings it back to the roots of 
you know, you build a car and you, you drive it down the street, you know, like it's pretty neat. Yeah, I can I can only imagine. The whole streetcar thing starts to always become a little bit questionable. And I mean, I don't know what the rules exactly are like in the US for what constitutes a, a streetcar. But I mean, the sort of vehicles that, that I see competing in these, if I tried to drive one of those around the streets here in New Zealand, that they'd, they'd lock you up and throw away the key. Yeah. There's just absolutely no way we're getting away with what you can. So how do you drive these things on the street and not have trouble with the authorities? Yeah, compared to New Zealand or Australia, and I have a lot of Australian friends and yeah, they're um, it's not comparable at all like especially the state i live in in florida like there's no it really doesn't matter like there's no emissions testing like i could probably get like a loud exhaust ticket if a cop wanted to be hassle us but as far as that as long as it has the turn signal indicators like there's just a basic set of rules the vin number to be licensed and insured okay that makes it easy then yeah so as far as the driving goes for legalities it's it's really easy there's not there's not a lot of laws against it no fair play to you a little jealous if i was honest let's talk about the car itself and before we jump into your current car as i understand it you had a an earlier version of this mustang that uh, was a bit more streetable that also went pretty damn quick from from what i understand and then you've you've decided to move that car on and build a new platform so can you give us a quick overview of the the first car and why you decided that you needed a new chassis to sort of go faster absolutely and the first car gets talked about a lot because like this is the car that kind of uh elevated me to where i am now like when i bought this car in 2014 it was almost brand new it was six months old 2013 mustang it was gotta have it green because i raced some motorcycles at the time dirt bikes and street bikes and i was a kawasaki guy and i loved that bright green and that's actually why i bought the bright green car just because it was kind of like kawasaki green and I bought the car intent to get back more into car drag racing. And I knew that, you know, the Coyote engine had been out for a few years at that point, And it already proved to be far superior than anything Ford had did, you know, the 10 years prior to that. So I bought the car and immediately I had purchased a turbo kit for it. And I bought a single turbo kit. It was like a bolt-on deal, 76 millimeter turbo. And I started, that was my first turbocharged vehicle. And I started with that car basically like everyone does. And it's now... 10 years later to the point that it is now, where it was turbo kit stock engine, stock engine E85, rods piston this engine, you know, it kind of went through every stage. The normal progression. The normal progression. And during that time, we were racing 6R80 transmissions with it because I refused to put a turbo 400 in it because it was still a brand new car to me. You know, I was like, I'm not going to gut this car. It's still like, you know, it's a really nice, complete, it's a stock car with a turbo kit. So I'm not going to put aftermarket transmission in it and ended up developing some transmission parts with Dan Otwave of Blue Streak Performance, who is in Australia. And now those transmissions, thanks to a lot of the work that we did together with that car, can, you know, it's been six seconds with that, you know, ZF six-speed overdrive transmission. My car never went six seconds. So, you know, I, I had to change the trans over in the like high sevens back some years ago. I guess there has been a lot of development now on that platform though, correct? That you probably didn't have access to back when you had that car? Yeah, well, no, um, we basically did most of that development with my car as far as the hard parts goes. It just got to the point where I wasn't willing to go those next steps with that transmission as far as like building a complete race car to have the six-speed overdrive. Like my concept of having the stock overdrive transmission was that it was in a very stock car. Like it was an Australian level street car in the sense that it just looked like a normal car. It wasn't, you know, a race car that was called a street car. So then I started racing more and wanting to go faster and wanting to race more than I drove. And I realized I need a more racing style transmission than a driving style transmission. And that, you know, that, that's where the transition happened there. And ended up going 698 at like 203 with that car. And it was complete, like, you know, like full stock interior, all roll up windows, like complete normal 2014 Mustang. Wow. Okay. That's a pretty impressive time slip for something that is still completely streetable. What was the decision behind starting afresh though, as opposed to further modifying that car when you wanted to go faster? Yeah. So it was kind of funny. Like it was after that event, it was at the Mod Nationals when I ran that time and I got the six. We were, you know, we were hunting that time for a little while, obviously, like everyone is. And like after that pass, like I just felt complete with that car. Like I didn't feel the urge to take that car further. I felt like it had did what it needed to do 
you know, and it was at the limit of a lot of things. Like it had a 10 point roll cage in it. It wasn't, it shouldn't have been going 200 miles per hour from a safety aspect. The next ET range for me, I wanted to go, like, I didn't want to go 690 and then 689. Like I wanted to go a lot faster. So instead of cutting that car up and spending the time and the money it would have taken to transform it to more of a race car, I decided to sell it and buy this rolling chassis that I bought from my car from Joel Steele, which was an existing stick shift race car that he was racing live. And he kind of wanted to sell it at the same time I wanted to sell mine. I convinced him to sell it as a roller because I knew that, you know, it had a 25.2 chassis in it already. It was four link. It was already, you know, pretty light in the sense of S197 that I could, you know, put my engine platform in and put build a turbo kit you know, and make a, a competitive car in the mid sixes. Okay. Just coming back one step for those who sort of aren't up to speed with drag racing lingo, what's a 25.2 chassis? What's that mean? So basically it's enough roll cage certified. The NHRA dictates the certification levels and they assign uh, numbers to them. And, you know, each second range, I believe it's broke down as a 999, 750, then a 650, and then a 60. And basically, it's the amount of bars that, you know, they dictate that are in place around the driver and, and in the cockpit that can protect you in a, in a crash at the speed that you're going. Okay, so essentially, the chassis, the roll cage structure just steps up and becomes more comprehensive and safer, obviously, the faster you want the car to go. Sure. And in turn, you have a stiffer, better chassis for racing, you know, where the other car was still just a factory unibody complete with a roll bar essentially welded to it, where this one... You know, this car started as a normal Mustang, but the unibody sections were cut out and then it has, you know, basically the chassis, the bars everywhere of the of the 25.2. I guess that also gives a lot more flexibility in the design of the four link rear end. Yes, exactly. And you could get one to a 25.3 with a stock three link rear end. You know, this car was already four linked in the classes I run. There wasn't a lot of dictation between like stock suspension to four link. So it was fine. Yep. All right, let's talk a little bit about the engine. And I actually want to start by talking about that turbo kit. Obviously, you got into the, the turbos fairly early on. Was there ever a consideration of a supercharger package? Because obviously, just like the Ford versus GM debate, there's those that go down the supercharger path and swear by them. And then there's the turbo guys, much like myself, who prefer the turbos. What's Why did you go that way? Uh, engine efficiency. You know, I saw it early on. I knew that, you know, the turbocharger is a more efficient power adder for that setup for the smaller engine so basically i got into turbos and you know never looked back you know i never actually never even thought about running the supercharger since i went turbocharger yeah i mean i've kind of been the same i've tuned enough uh, supercharged cars in my time but i just prefer the flexibility is probably one of the key things i like with turbochargers and just the the ease of which you can change your boost down the track and you know the psi for psi i think it'd be hard to argue that you're not going to make more power with a properly sized turbocharger as well. With the engine platform, I mean, obviously you can't go and jam an LS in a Ford Mustang. That's not really going to fly with either camp. But obviously the LS and the Ford Coyote engines, there's again a loyal band of followers for both. One of the advantages I see with the LS platform is out of the box, you've got more capacity. Five liters in terms of the Coyote, but you've also got overhead cams. You know, what's your sort of take on the pros and cons of the Coyote five liter V8 versus uh, maybe an LS3 or something of that nature? Sure. So for me, I've never I've never raced an LS engine personally, so you know I don't have anything against them at all. You know, fast is fast. Like you know, if the engine's making power and a car is fast, I respect it the same no matter what engine it has in it. But if you know, for me now after building this Coyote and looking at what it has to offer at its capacity, it's airflow of the engine. The amount of airflow for engine speed that you can get from a Coyote is just, it's not matched by the LS at all. You know, in my opinion that they're doing it with more muscle, more cubic inch, lower revs, but you know, a drag car can be faster with a higher ever, a higher revving engine because of the power cycles. Yeah, okay, fair, fair cool. In terms of that high revving point, what are you revving it to on the drag strip? It revs to close to 10,000. Okay. It gives us a, a bit of an understanding. I mean, you're at or close to sort of 3,000 horsepower at the hubs with this combination as it's currently running. What do you need to change, if not absolutely every single component, in order to achieve that sort of power level? 
from a stock engine to the engine that I'm running? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, so brief rundown on my engine. It starts as factory Ford block. You know, we order it from Ford. It, it's the latest version of this engine from Ford that they call the Predator block. It's offered in the GT500s. Uh, so we start with that block. We start with a set of just Ford GT350 cylinder heads. The block is then sleeved with an aftermarket sleeve. Fast forward race engines is the, the engine builder for me who, you know, we've brought up, we've come up together from the rods and pistons engine to this version of the engine now that we have to, you know, Joe Oruin is a great guy. We work together really closely every day with the platform. So factory block, aftermarket sleeve, that's it for the block. There's no other modifications done to the crankcase. Use the stock main cap. The deck uh, is untouched. It's still a full uh, wet block, wet deck. While we're talking about the, the block there, uh, did you get to a point where you found the limit of the stock unsleeved block? Or was the sleeving just a precaution you went went down that path anyway? No, so the uh, a stock unsleeved block, pretty much in any form of the Coyotes, because you know, there's, there's four or five different blocks now from 2011 to now. You know, the earlier ones, 900,000 horsepower was the limit of the stock sleeve. And then they went into the spray in liners in the Gen 3 and into the GT500 engines. And there's guys making 12, 1300 horsepower on that stock sleeve. But again, you know, they then start delaminating or the cylinder starts cracking at that point. So, yeah, the stock sleeve doesn't get you very far. So pretty much if you're going to the stock sleeve doesn't go any further than the stock rods and pistons. So kind of the first upgrade for a short block on these Coyotes is to go right to a sleeve block with a rod and piston upgrade. Yeah, so it's an expensive first step, but a necessary one. Right, exactly. But you go from a 1,000 horsepower capable short block to a 2,000 horsepower capable short block on your first step. And then, you know, the guys running them at 1,500, 1,600 horsepower, like, you know, I have friends and stuff, like these cars are in these cars, the engines are in these cars for years and they and they just run. That's yeah, impressive. Yeah, they don't have any, any issues at all. all. Right, we'll continue on with the engine combination. I just interrupted you on that point, but uh, yeah, let's keep going. So that was it for the crankcase. Uh, aftermarket sleeves, the heads are ported by Fast Forward, but it's a, it's a pretty basic setup. They're not, there's not a ton, like as far as CNC work done to them as, as a lot of people think, uh, has Freya valve and uh, custom valve spring and comp cams uses the factory lifter and the factory follower, you know, still hydraulic setup just as it came, uh, as that sense. The engine that I was running up until sick week, the one in the, the video, you know, we made close to 3000, that engine still utilized the stock crankshaft, which we, you know, at that point, we started to notice that we're, we're having problems with main bearing life, you know, at that boost level. And you can't be too mad at it, you know, $400 no. crankshaft from Ford. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's got a billet crank now. And it's like, well, I mean, every other engine already has a billet crank at, you know, a lot less horsepower than what we were making with this one. I think it seems from what I've seen of your videos that you've sort of taken the approach of rather than throwing a big old bag of cash at the engine and changing every component out, you've more gone down the path of, well, let's actually see what physically needs to be changed as opposed to changing parts that are actually up to the task, which I think is a trap that a lot of car builders sort of get sucked into. There's shiny parts on the internet, so let's just buy them all and put them in the engine. And I, I've spoken about this previously on the podcast, but with my 4G63 drag engine program, we were running an aftermarket billet crankshaft, which was pretty expensive. And at one point, we pulled the thing out and had it crack tested, and it was basically cracked in the fillet radius of, of every journal. So obviously, you don't put it back in. And at a pinch, we had a factory crank lying around and put that in because we were going racing. And that crankshaft, lasted just as well as the billet crank we pulled it out and it was cracked again but it's one of those things did, did it crack on the first pass or did it crack on the pass just before you pulled it apart you, you just don't get to find that out but again instead of a four or five thousand dollar crankshaft we were using a eight hundred dollar crankshaft so happy days if it's not broken don't fix it and, and a lot of that i give the testament to joe you know my engine builder because you know uh leading up to it i'm like man we should probably move to a billet crank because you know you you see we tend to take, you know, our data and our data only for, you know, as something we write down as, okay, this is a fact, you know, you see there's, there's plenty of people breaking blocks or, or breaking engines and you don't know everything that's attributed to why that failure happened. So we try to keep our focus on to what we're doing. And, you know, he's like, man, there's, like you said, he's like, billet cranks have their own issues. Like, you know, we don't have a problem with the stock crank yet. Like, 
let's not spend five thousand dollars on a crankshaft to have it crack in the burnout box or, or have another issue that a billet crank can have because it's it, it's more for a race engine and at the time you know we're building up we're building more of a street engine and we're building engines that the everyday mustang owner is going to buy to put into their street car and, and not everyone oh but very very few people want to buy a five thousand dollar crankshaft and if it's not needed there's just there's no point yeah couldn't agree more in terms of the problems you were starting to see up around that three thousand horsepower mark with bearing wear obviously indicates you're starting to get some crankshaft flex and as you say can't really be too angry at that given 3,000 horsepower, let's be honest, that's that's to be expected. I'm just wondering, and I know you've got an engine builder so you may not be able to or give me much information on this, but up to that point with the stock crankshaft, were you building in additional clearance in the bearings to to sort of help make everything live with the flex you're inevitably getting? Yeah, so we, we did. We did move to that. The first indication of this problem happened was actually last year at FL2K during qualifying, I actually got a low oil pressure warning on a run and we came back and we pulled the filter out and it was full of bearing. And that, that was our first big sign of, okay, something's wrong. And we actually had another short block ready to go for the next engine. Cause with Joe, you know, I have two engines so we can try to have one getting, you know, uh, the next revision or stage done. So the car's not down for a long time. Cause we race a lot. And we took the engine out and we went back to a shop because it was it was local to this race and we took the heads off my engine and we, we saw the the bearing wear and i wish i had that video to show you because it's super interesting where you, you can see the flex in the bearing because it's only on the connecting rod side of the power stroke of that bearing so you, you could actually you know it was the back of this bearing the front of that bearing so it was pretty visual to see it was pretty neat so at that time we went ahead and he went ahead and took that other short block apart and then, you know, put in larger, you know, reclearance bearings for a larger oil clearance. And at the same time, you know, I realized also that, you know, I need to start working on my oil system better, you know. So at that time I had a five stage oil pump on the car, you know, and we were maintaining 75 or so PSI oil pressure at that time, you know, and it's like, man, I, you know, I wish we could get a hundred, 120, you know, we're trying to find the crankshaft's flexing, but we're always going to have flex. We have a stock block, a lot of things. There's going to be things flexing. So we, you know, we, we look around the crankshaft also. What else could we can improve as far as bearing clearance or, or oiling goes? And it turns out it didn't matter much. We didn't smoke a set of bearings after that. The clearance did help longevity of it. I would monitor the filter and kind of see, you know, shavings or material. And I ended up racing that engine for the rest of the year. But I did put a set of main bearings in it, you know, throughout that time. But we never did have a full failure. Like, it, you know, in the dyno video, that was that same engine. Uh, oil pressure and all that stuff was the same. It just, you know, we had put a set of bearings in it. Yeah. It gets to a point where some of these things become essentially consumables. And again, you can't be too angry at that when you've got a production production components doing things that are so far out of the range of, of what the car rolled off the showroom floor with. You know, there are some expected downsides to all of that. With that dry sump system, so one of the aspects here is when we increase the bearing clearances, basically you're generally going to see a drop in oil pressure. There's just more leakage, for want of a better term, of the oil coming out of those journals and just leaking out. So you normally sort of find that if you don't do anything else, you, you do see the oil pressure drop. With the dry sump system, I'm assuming you can really sort of adjust the pressure pump to get your oil pressure back where you needed it anyway. Yeah, right. You can crank it out. And in that also in that same time, I switched oil pump design and I don't want to get into manufacturer things as far as oil pump goes, but I went to a different style pump with more stages and we were able to get better crankcase evacuation, get the oil out of the engine better and maintain, you know, 100, 115 PSI oil pressure with the more stages and things like that. Uh, now, there's a few things with the dry sump system. Obviously, one of the key aspects of it is engine reliability, regardless of the G-forces under acceleration, braking, or if it's a road race car cornering, you're always going to have a constant supply of high pressure oil to the bearing. So that's one of the key aspects with it. But there are some performance benefits as well. You sort of just alluded to the scavenge stages evacuating the oil and blow-by gases out of the, the crankcase. So that can be beneficial because it can help reduce windage losses. Essentially, the crankshaft is easier to spin in the crank in the crankcase. It's not going through an oil mist. And also, we can see benefits in terms of ring seal because we've got lower pressure in the crankcase. 
So I'm just interested here with a high boost turbo setup, what sort of crankcase pressure are you seeing? The sort of uh, the assumption that you're going to be able to pull a vacuum, which with a naturally aspirated engine, you absolutely can. I've yet to see a, a significant vacuum with a high boost turbo engine though. Yeah. Like you said, you know, we were trying to achieve as much vacuum as possible because with this small capacity engine and large turbochargers, we needed to make as much horsepower naturally aspirated as it can to help spool these turbochargers. So, you know, it, it maintains a, a good crankcase vacuum up until the higher boost levels. So we run about 53, 54 PSI of boost in this engine. And currently we're seeing about 1.8 PSI of positive crankcase pressure uh, down the track. Yeah, okay. That kind of fits with what? my own sort of experience has been essentially though i don't know if you've got any numbers could you give us a comparison if it was a conventional wet sump engine running the same boost everything else being equal what sort of positive pressure would you expect to see in the crankcase then i don't know from personal experience but i've seen some other coyote engine people like breaking valve covers and blowing caps off i imagine the crankcase pressure is pretty high on that kind of setup with it with that and they also they have an inherent G-force issue with the stock sump of the oil pressure maintaining for the first one or two seconds of the track. There's not a really good oil pan currently on that engine from the factory, and you have to run them two quarts sometimes over full on oil to keep good oil pressure because of G-forces. Yeah, that's sort of a, a bit of a band-aid really. The sump that I had on my old drag car, my Evo, that was sort of baffled and it had a nice little baffle box around the pickup with trap doors and everything. It was basically as, as good as you're able to make a, a wet sump. And it was actually really good down the strip, but where I was having problems, which is definitely less of an issue, but still not what you want to see, was at the end of the strip, you'd pull the chute and, and clutch in, and you'd see the, the oil pressure there from sort of 10, 11,000 RPM drop to 20 PSI, which is a little scary. I mean, fortunately, there's, there's not a lot of load on the engine at that point because you're off the throttle, but still, it's sort of reasonably quickly after that, we made the call to go dry sump on that. And... It actually interestingly transformed the engine. Like we weren't, I wouldn't have thought we were seeing major bearing wear issues, but I did class those bearings as a consumable. So we were replacing big end and main bearings pretty regularly, maybe every couple of meetings or so. And after we went dry sump, yeah, you know, I'd pull it apart. It looked like brand new, so you just put it back together and you just about do a season of racing on the same set of bearings, which was quite a quite a noticeable difference. Yeah, I think that the issue with the dry sump market right now, or at least for a lot of Coyote guys or other guys with new platforms is it's not easy to do one because there's not a lot of parts available. You kind of, you know, like the mount on my car, JT Oliver, you had him on your show before, JT Power, you know, he he designed it in CAD and built the mount, you know, and it, it took a lot of effort to get that big pump on my car. So you know, that's probably one of the struggles a lot of people, the regular people have with it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's much easier if you can just buy an off-the-shelf part and fit it rather than having to actually go through the, the R&D development process yourself. One of the big limiting factors on any turbocharged engine, or at least the ones I've been involved with, is head gasket sealing, uh, and it's a pretty common topic we discuss on the podcast. What's your solution there, and how, how effective or rock-solid is it? So, you know, we have our, again, we've, you know, we've come up from the stock engine to where we are now. So the engine actually has a really good sealing head. The latest version of the block that we run uses a 12 millimeter head stud that's deep in down by the mains. It gets clamped to 120 foot pounds. So, you know, it has a lot of clamping force on the surface, but there's still just four bolts per cylinder. So you're always going to run into some issues. A standard MLS gasket, you can use a Ford gasket. Actually, you don't even need anything real exotic with a very short raised o-ring in the block uh, joe does like on the stage three engine just extra pressure on the gasket that gasket system will take you to close to 2500 horsepower you know and that that doesn't require you know any machining or, or service life you put it on torque it down and it's good to go after that we move to a copper gasket on my engine and it's a very old system it's a receiver groove and a small stainless o-ring and that system has taken us to where we are now. Uh, we're starting to see a little rise in crankcase pressure. We saw it on the dyno. We saw it the last time we were at the track as we try to increase power, you know, above that 53, 54 pounds boost level. We're still in our diagnostic stage or our research stage of, of tracking that to see how bad it's going to get, if it's going to get worse and what our next move is to get that better. We're doing an engine teardown actually Saturday 
of the engine that was in the car on the dyno. And we're going to do a video and get that off and then, you know, see what's happening to that gasket. Possibly maybe we just move to like a flame hoop setup or something with more surface area to get the interaction of the gasket into the head. Uh, so we're going to um, start to evaluate and decide on what the, what the next plan will be for that and to what happens with the current coolant pressure now. You know, we have enough data on this car and that's what's so good with it. Every pass, like if something is two PSI different, you know, we're, we're going to pick up on it and, and start tracking it, you know, and start tracing it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of things I'm just going to dive back into there. There is, I, I think, a, a certain number of people that believe that an MLS gasket is not compatible with an O-ring. Uh, you mentioned that you were running that up to, I think you said 2,500 horsepower? Yeah, that's where we saw it. Yeah, so yeah, uh, that, that was a similar system to what I actually ultimately ran on my 4G63s as well. And you do need to be a little bit careful because obviously those MLS gaskets are, are not really compressible like a copper gasket. So it's a long time now. I think we're only running something like five to seven thousandths of an inch protrusion on the O-ring. But just enough, it just bites into that gasket. And I found that worked really well. Interestingly, we tried the copper gasket stainless O-ring receiver groove technique uh, at one point and I had absolutely no success with it but obviously it's pretty well proven it, it's the go-to for the likes of top fuel top alcohol so you know but I don't I don't know whether the production engine there was too much flex in the cylinder head casting or you know the, the block or both that it just didn't work for us obviously it's working reasonably well for you Long story short here, one of the downsides with copper gaskets is they do a horrible job of sealing the oil and the water and when you're running a, a wet block with I'm assuming still water passages between the, the head and the block, uh, how are you going about sealing that copper gasket for water and oil purposes? Uh, Joe has a, a glue that he uses, you know he doesn't advertise what it is, it's, a, it's an epoxy that we put on there and it works pretty well. And one of the issues we ran into which a lot of people do is to retorque the heads. The camshafts have to come out. So to do like the first retorque, you know, it to pull the cams out of the engine. There's a lot of chains. The whole front cover has got to come off. So you know, we made a, a a water heater, an electric water pump, and we do it in the engine room before the engine goes in the car. We bring it up to operating temp backwards. You know, we use the the hot water to heat the engine, and the, and then get the retorque done. And it's been good. We've gone back and tried to you know see but we haven't had any water leaks or any oil leaks yet with with the glue that he's using yeah nice uh that that retalk is something that a lot of people don't do i've found it to be an essential almost irrespective of the head gasket solution uh, if you do want reliability because it can be quite amazing once you've heat cycled the engine a couple of times just how much more movement you'll get out of those head studs talking it back up to the same torque setting. So maybe a little tip there for those who aren't doing that and are having head gasket sealing issues. Yep. And that's one thing that we're going to do part of this engine teardown is because because I physically can't do a retorque in the car without pulling the engine pretty much all the way apart. I never have. So, you know, we'll have this engine on the stand. We'll, we'll see where the bolts are torqued to now after they've had 60 passes or so on them to see maybe, you know, our fixes after 10 more passes after the initial, maybe it needs a retorque again. Maybe I need to pull the cams out and get a retorque to get it to that next step. Like I said, we're still in our investigation stage of that. I just wanted to take a moment out of our interview with Brett and talk about a course that I think would really suit anyone who's enjoying this interview so far, and that is our Practical Engine Building course. Our most enthusiasts tend to think that building their own engines is beyond them, but the reality is if you've got a little bit of patience and an eye for detail, absolutely this is something you can achieve at home. Another concern I hear regularly is that you're going to need tens of thousands of dollars worth of tools in order to build your own engines. The reality is that it's absolutely not the case and with just your usual mechanics tool set plus a few key additional tools you can do a great job of building your own engines. This course actually begins by looking at failure analysis which is so often overlooked but absolutely critical. Often I see engines that have been re rebuilt that have suffered some form of failure but no one's really undercovered the root cause of that failure and lo and behold the freshly built engine with thousands of dollars spent on it is going to fail again. So here we dive deep into the different modes of failure, what you should be looking for and how to find that root cause so you can fix it. 
we only look at some of the practical engine building skills that you're going to need to know. I'm talking here about how to fit bearings, how to prepare your engine block, how to measure bearing clearances, piston deck clearance, how to balance your own pistons and connecting rods, how to install con rods onto pistons, how to gap your piston rings, just to name a few. We then move into the HPA 10 step process and I know that when you get all of your engine components back from the machinist it can be a bit daunting knowing what to do first and what order to progress in. By breaking the entire job down into the HPA 10 step process each of those individual steps is relatively quick and easy to complete and in no time you've got to the end you've got a completely assembled engine and you're going to have the confidence that when it comes time to start that engine for the first time all of the parts you've chosen, all of the clearances you've set are going to be perfect and your engine is going to start, it's going to produce great power, great torque and most importantly great reliability. It is important to mention that this course is generic so it doesn't matter if you're dealing with a four cylinder naturally aspirated engine, maybe a push rod V8 or a quad cam V12, this course will be perfect for you. After the body of the course we then move into our library of worked examples which is an informal walkthrough of that 10 step process where we apply it to a variety of different engines to give you experience on a wide range of different platforms. Now this course is usually $199 US dollars, you can use the coupon code BRETT50 and that will get you 50% off the purchase of this course. So it's a great deal but you are still protected by a 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee if you purchase and for any reason at all decide it's not quite what you expected let us know you'll get a full refund of the purchase price. We'll put a link to that course as well as the discount code in the show notes. Now let's get back into our interview with Brett. All right where do you sort of see the limit with the block being still production and is there an expectation that in time you're going to end up being forced to move to a billet version? Yeah, so it's going to be one of two areas. It's going to be the head gasket sealing, or if we can get that head gasket sealed up, then it's going to push the crank out of it. Like, you know, to seal it up to a higher power level that we're going to run now. Like, it's the the same situation that's been, the, the you know, for every factory block. So, you know, we're running, like I said, 53, 54 pounds now, but the engine is just showing signs. Like, it's still making close to 45 horsepower per pound of boost. So it wants to be a 65 pounds boost like it's gonna you know make that much more power there but you know something maybe something fails so you know once we get the head sealed up at that power level then it's going to try to push the crank out and then we'll see we'll see when that happens well one of the things that uh, was easy to overlook as a benefit with the billet blocks is generally you know particularly if they're a, a wet block design so it still has an actual water jacket so it's streetable they'll usually incorporate a, a much thicker deck surface and again that that doesn't seem maybe too critical but these components flex around quite a lot and just adding material to that deck surface can help reduce the flex in the deck of the block meaning that it's going to be able to do a better job of, of sealing that head gasket so it can be a, a really big benefit of course then there's also uh, the potential to go to much larger head studs as well so the whole thing sort of all, all works in conjunction in terms of billet blocks for the coyote platform are there uh, many options there's two options currently, two companies, and you know I believe they're pretty similar from what I've seen. I haven't looked at them real hard yet, just because I want to keep the car in drag and drive trim for the foreseeable future. So for me, it's not an option because they don't have water. It's a it's a drive block, you know. So you know if if a water block does come out or begins to get made, you know maybe that we move that direction, you know, as just a progression of the platform and of the car. But for now, it's not really it's not really on my radar because I'm not ready to make the car, you know, the full race car version yet without the water. This also begs the question of how much more power can you actually get to the track? You know, people think that uh, drag racing is just a case of, well, we'll chuck another 200 horsepower at it and it's going to go two tenths quicker. But, you know, when you, you're talking cars at the level of yours, quite often you're, you're severely traction limited for at least a big portion of the pass. Yeah, I think in that aspect we do a really good job. And, you know, we run a 275 radial tire and there's cars in Pro 275s going 360 or so to the eighth on that tire. Uh, we've been 409. My goal, you know, coming up is to go a little quicker than that in eighth mile trim. Uh, I believe 
a car has been 580 to the quarter on that 275 tire, you know, we're nowhere close to that. Yeah. So the tire can put more power to the track, essentially. It's been proven. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, my car, it's not as light as the Pro 275 cars, but it's also not really heavy in the aspect of that, too. Like, I know we can, you know, we, we couldn't possibly get to their ET range, even if we had their horsepower because of our weight. But I think we could get close to it. I'd rather have the power at this point and then manage the traction just because, like I said, I think we do a really good job of that. And right now I'm just wanting 200 more horsepower, not necessarily wanting more traction. Yeah, okay. Okay, fair. All right, let's move on and talk a, a little bit about the electronics package in the car. You've already alluded to the fact that you made the change from AEM to Motec. Can you give us a, a bit of a rundown on the electronic components that you've got managing everything? Yep, so it has a Motec M150, a Motec PDM30, and a C1212 dash, and an EEEE uh, expander for thermocouplers, and a few more I.O. Uh, the car uses Rife sensors front to rear. Basically, all the pressure sensors and speed sensors are from Rife, and that's it. That's the electronics package. You know, the Motec does everything in the in the one box so it doesn't have a lot of boxes one aspect with the m1 platform which again we've, we've talked about uh, a few times in previous episodes is that uh, for all intents and purposes it's just a, a blank box which will do whatever you tell it to based on the firmware that's developed and this production firmware that motec provide and then there's a number of aftermarket suppliers making their own firmware packages that can be very tailored to a given task such as drag racing i'm just interested what what you're running there for firmware so the firmware that i run is a small variation of usa drag so i ran usa drag up until a few months ago and i'm fortunate enough to be uh, good friends with a guy named bit who does motec firmware and he's made some additions to that just and and it's just us being picky because we want to race the car a certain way so it's like oh if we had you know, this on a button, that'd be easier, you know, and Motec could do the updates eventually to USA Drag. They just take some time because they have to go through Australia to, to get that firmware updated. But it's really, it's really close to the USA Drag package, actually. That package has enough to do very, very powerful things in these cars. Could you give us some, maybe a couple of examples of what that Drag package, just the production firmware, maybe not necessarily your tweaks, what drag specific functions are incorporated there that uh, a gpa or gpr package that you'd use on a street car or maybe a road race car doesn't have yeah so the drag racing strategies are going to be transmission based there's a lot of time based strategies because most drag runs are tuned over uh, what's called a race time so the second you let off the button until you know the timer starts and then you're going down the drag strip so there's going to be a lot of boost control a lot of ignition timing ride height control for a wheelie sensor, ride height control for suspension, ride height, transmission control for dump valves for the first, you know, because, you know, we'll use the transmission converter pressure to slip the clutch in a sense to apply power to the track and, the, and for the whole run, shifting timers, shifting retards, transmission lockup strategies, launch control strategies, staging strategies uh, you know there's a lot of very specific things that you know you would only use for drag racing yeah okay and, and that's totally reasonable as well it just sort of shows how flexible that particular platform is because when people hear you know motec m150 it's important to understand that the m150 is irrelevant it's really the firmware that you're running and the functionality or strategies as you put it that are incorporated in the firmware that really make the difference now, I want to dive into a couple of the strategies, if we can, and just talk a little bit about how you're implementing them. For a start, let's talk about the launch strategy. How does that work for your particular vehicle? You've got an automatic transmission. You've got large turbos on a relatively small capacity engine. How hard is it to actually build boost on the line, and how does that work? Well, you know, Job Spatter is the main tuner of the car, so... Out of respect for him and everything he's worked on really hard, I can't go deeply involved in that subject because the car is very competitive right now. We have a you know a lot of people trying to outrun us and we're trying to stay in front. But with the Motec ECU and everything that's available to us, it's actually you know I say easy for us, but the car does very well. And we have an engine speed for manifold pressure. You know we get the engine speed up, get the turbos going get the manifold pressure up and then you, you can you you know a lot of things you can tell if you just listen to the vehicle 
you know, on the racetrack, you listen to a pass, you listen to a stage, you know, the engine's going to go up, then it, it's going to, the speed's going to come down to its launch chip, and then I'm going to stage the car in and be ready to go, you know, and all that stuff's happening in the background. So, you know, it's it's working very well in its current state with the 8385 turbos. Uh, normally, you've sort of got, I guess, two key controls at your fingertips with the launch strategy. One is the boost target at launch and the other would be the engine RPM. I'm just wondering, are you manipulating those on a pass-by-pass basis depending on you know, how the track evolves or is that sort of a fit and forget? Yeah, it is what it is. You've, you've proven it works. No, no, no. It's pass by pass basis. So the way we have the setup now, we have nine map slots set, and um, I have a driver switch in the car, in the car, and I have a confirmation on the dash of which map slot it's in. We have the map slots built off of previous known runs, so we know what that does to the 60 foot. We know what it does, you know, all the metrics down the track. So we know how each fast each map slot is, and then. Jim Braun is usually at me with me at all the big races. We'll gauge the track for the round. We'll Depending on if we're in qualifying or depending on if we're in eliminations, depending on our strategy, if you know who you're racing, you know how fast that car is, you know the track condition, you kind of pick an EP that you know the car run. Like, like we can walk out on the racetrack and know the temperature of the racetrack and kind of put your foot down and, you know, visually see how much rubber's there and put your foot down and see how much goo's there. And now we, we know this car so well, you know, I could walk out there for 10 seconds and be like, oh, okay, we can go this fast. You know, and then you you pick that slot, and then it goes that fast. I guess as well, what, when you've got a car that's running a PB, I think six twenty six two twenty seven is that, that about right? Yep, that's it. Uh, you sort of you could probably dial it back and and run a six five, and kind of feel like you're sitting on the couch. It's all pretty, relatively speaking, easy going. Is that is that sort of fair? At this point, it is. But you know, that took the last year and a half was data collection tuning you know so you know we built this database of tune-ups and versus track conditions versus density altitude that at this point yes you know we can we know what the da is we know what the track looks like you know i could pick a number and we can put it in the car and it's going to run that you know outside of something failing and you know we keep up on the maintenance keep up on the suspension and the shocks and we we look at every aspect of it every run just to keep it consistent and you know that's why this car wins so many races is because it's consistent and we know it so well. Yeah, it's sort of the polar opposite to a lot of what I see with the import scene. And I mean, I was guilty of this myself, where guys are going out to run PBs or world records and you, you can't go rounds because you're never going to be able to actually beat the guy in the other lane or girl for that matter. So yeah, a car that actually is consistent and can do laps and pull a really good light and you know within you know probably a couple of hundreds what it's going to actually run, that's what you need to actually be competitive. Yeah, I'd say that's an inherent flaw of a lot of drag racers is, you know, they work on the car a lot and they get to the event and they want to run a PB every pass. And, you know, like I, I've told a lot of people when I built this car, like I built it so I could win races. Like, you know, going fast is going to be a byproduct of us getting better with the car or, or being at an event that we need to go faster to win. Uh, but you know consistency and building that that library of data and being able to just run the same pass no matter what the time of day is or or who you're up against that's what's going to win the races i think it sort of feeds into what you just mentioned there as well as the data collection when you're going out and trying to run a pb or a beat a world record every pass and you're breaking things you, you're not getting the passes in to build up that knowledge base that's so important to then be able to go and run faster passes so like the two sort of go hand in hand together I think. I want to come back to another term that you used which we hear thrown around with drag racing quite a bit which is DA or density altitude but again for for those who aren't up to speed with that could you give us a, a quick overview of what DA is and why it's it's so critical in a drag racing sense? Yeah so it depends on your combo how critical it is the density altitude is the amount of air that's available in the air molecule that you're breathing, right? So the cooler, the denser the air is, there's more oxygen in that air. So it's going to compress and make more horsepower at the same manifold pressure, or if there is manifold pressure, that aspect. My car runs an air-to-air intercooler. A lot of methanol cars don't run any intercooler. The imports still run an air-to-water intercooler, which I would if I didn't want to sacrifice the weight loss according to that. With an air to water intercooler, typically you're making your own DA because your, your starting line air temp is typically always the same. So for, for that particular setup, I don't believe it's going to be as crucial as it is to like my setup. 
But for mine, basically, if the air is really good, the car is going to make more horsepower at, or it's going to make manifold pressure easily or more easily. So we control our boost range with CO2. So you command a CO2 pressure on top of the wastegate, and in turn, you get out this much boost pressure. But depending on how your tune-up is or how your boost control is, if the air is better, 10 pounds of CO2, that usually means 20 pounds of boost. Well, now it's making 25 pounds of boost or the turbo spools faster. So it can drastically affect your run because you're going to be making more power in different ranges. So essentially, if you had a, a tune-up that was dialed in for poor DA, and then all of a sudden the density altitude improved and, and maybe now we've got an effective density altitude below sea, sea level, if you didn't adjust your tune-up, basically pull some CO2 out of it and hence pull some boost out of it, you're going to blow the tyres off it and go nowhere? Right, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the, the things with drag and drives that gets challenging too because Normally at a race, you start at a, at a track, your DA will change throughout the day, depending on, you know, weather conditions, the sun's out or if the sun's not out. But we raced from Bradington to South Georgia. So, you know, we, you know, we had 2000 feet density altitude changes from track to track. So we're trying to make a consistent car at a different racing surface, a different temperature, a different altitude, all within that week. So that, you know, it adds a bit of the challenge to it, which is what we like, is why we do it. Yeah, lots of complexities going on in there. All right, diving a little bit further into some of the systems, you mentioned that you've got ride height sensors for wheelie detection here. I'm interested specifically how you're doing that because there's a, a couple of variations. Some people are using laser ride height, some are using shock travel potentiometers, and then there's also some that have, I don't really know whether it became successful. We've talked to a few in the past who are using IMUs or gyroscopes to sort of look at the rate of pitch and, and sort of control things off that. So how do you do it? Yeah, so my car has all of the sensors you mentioned on it. It has uh, shock potentiometers, but those aren't used for wheelie control. Those are used just for shock tuning. So you can see where the shock position is during the run and adjust the extension and the compression variant depending on power and track conditions. For the wheelie control, we use a laser ride height sensor. Basically, you know, it's zero at ride height and then there's a point of every car is gonna be different to where we want the ECU to start doing something. Okay, uh, okay, at this point, you know, it's going to, because once it gets to a certain point, it's just gonna keep going backwards, right? You just get the pendulum effect and it's gonna drive drive up. Uh, no wheelie bars on this this car? No. No, radio cars don't well, don't use a wheelie bar. Just thought we'll, we'll clear that one up. So we don't race the car on the wheelie sensor. The wheelie sensor is there to save a run. So if you're, you know, naturally you want no power reduction during a run because you're trying to go as fast as you can to win the round. But depending on the track conditions and depending on my suspension setup, the looser you run the like the front suspension. So the more you let the car move during that first 60 feet, the easier it's going to be on the rear tire, the more traction you're going to have. The more you let the front end move and the more you let the car move, the more prone it's going to be to wheelie. So that's where, you know, we have the ride height sensor there to catch that. And the system's so tuned in now that it's hard to even hear it. If you watch the car go down the track, you won't see the tire barely leave the ground. You won't really hear a reduction in power but the ECU is doing it so fast, it's basically just kind of slapping it on the back of the head, getting the front end back to its control range, and then letting the car go drive down the track. Am I safe to assume here, using a combination of maybe ignition retard initially, if it just needs a subtle reduction in torque, and then if it's still coming up, maybe something a bit more aggressive like an ignition cut or a fuel cut? Absolutely. Yeah, it'll use, it'll use timing retard for the first segment, you know, and there's a ramp rate, you know, if it's gaining this many inches per second compared to this many inches per second, it's going to be more aggressive or less aggressive or initiate a cylinder cut. Okay. In terms of the power delivery or torque delivery as the car goes down the, the strip, I'm assuming here you're using some kind of timer-based boost control strategy? Yep. Timer-based boost control and ignition. Yeah. Okay. And again, is this something that you're looking at data after a pass and making adjustments? Or again, you've got those map slots, you've sort of got all of that data already you can just go to a, a separate a different map and be a bit more aggressive if maybe the track can can take some more power right now with the you know the library of tune-ups we have are, are all really well so right now we're just kind of picking between the slots but everyone you know you still will get a variable where you want to like be between the two like okay i want this 330 with this 60 foot you know so then 
and then we make those changes there. Or if we go out to go faster than we've been before, then you're you're in a range you haven't been before. So then you know you, you move to that. Yeah. Okay. Talking a little bit further about the boost control, you mentioned CO2, which is kind of the norm, I guess, for high output turbocharged drag cars. Uh, can you give us a bit more insight into why everyone goes to CO2? Is this just to get a wider range between the minimum and maximum boost pressures you want to run? A wider range and just better control because you have, you know, 100 pounds of CO2, whatever you set on your regulator, typically it's around 100, you know, ready to go and transition from how much CO2 is on the starting line for the first millisecond of the run to transition into that. You don't have to wait on manifold pressure to have pressure for the wastegate. So, you, you know, you can artificially close the wastegate, command more CO2, beginning part of the run to get the turbos sped up, you know, and then taper it off towards the end. It just seems more controllable with the known pressure, with the static pressure of the CO2 bottle rather than the variable pressure of the manifold. Yeah, I, I think uh, for those who sort of aren't up to speed on this, instead of using the boost pressure available in the inlet manifold or intake plumbing to plumb to the wastegate for boost control, we're using, as you say, a regulated supply of, of CO2. And yeah, two advantages with that. One, as you say, it, it's 100 psi or whatever you set the regulator to, so it's always a, a known consistent value as opposed to if you're using manifold pressure, that's going to vary, obviously, with our boost pressure, so that's a variable. The other side of that, though, is you've got a higher pressure for control of the wastegate. So you know, if you've got, if you're running 50 psi of boost, that's all you've got to force that wastegate closed. And where this becomes an issue is, particularly if you want a wide range of boost, say you want to leave the line with 20 or 24 psi because that's all the car will put to the track. If you weren't running CO2, you might be capped at maybe a maximum of 40 or maybe 50 psi so many variables i can't give a number there if you wanted to get to 80 or 90 or 100 psi you're just not going to get there without co2 control so i just wanted to clear that up for those who maybe haven't heard of that technique before i'm interested with the the control strategy is the ecu solely controlling dome pressure the co2 pressure being applied to the wastegate uh and then the boost is just whatever it is going to be as a result of that pressure in the wastegate, or is it using CO2 in a roundabout way to then control a specific boost target? No, we're just, our, uh, it's only closed loop to the dome pressure. Yeah, okay. So it's up to you to basically have an understanding of what dome pressure results in X boost pressure. Right, which on a car like mine with turbo inlets varies down the, the track because, you know, uh, Getting close to the eighth mile as the car gets over 170 or so, the positive pressure in front of the turbos requires less CO2 to make the same boost. So it's being uh, manipulated the whole way down. So what what makes the boost at the 60 foot doesn't make the same boost, you know, down track. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. In terms of the turbo sizing, uh, again, in one of your videos that I've I've stalked, you, you've talked about the sort of jump in turbo size that you've made, which again, I think is pretty much par for the course with turbocharged drag cars. We do tend to get a little bit power hungry and I don't know, I, I sort of find at least with the import engines, it's really easy to make just about within reason however much power you want just with putting a bigger turbocharger on. However, the, the problem that this then brings in, or can be a problem, is that the boost threshold or where in the RPM range that the turbo will actually start making usable boost obviously increases. The, the turbo's bigger, there's more inertia, it needs more exhaust gas energy. And that can have a negative impact on how well the car 60 foots, which is so critical to the rest of the pass. I'm interested to get your sort of impressions of how you've dealt with that, how it's affected the car as you've stepped up turbo size. Sure. Yeah, it's 60 foot and it's and it's spooling. So one of the things that, you know, we've been up against with this car, and with this engine platform is, is, you know, we've been working with a stock engine. So you can't be really or a stock casting It's not a stock engine. So you can't be just super mean to it like you can with a lot of horsepower engines because you, you're just going to break it. And we're dealing with a, a relatively small engine, you know, cubic inch wise for a V8. So, you know, the car started with 76, 75, because that's basically where we left off on the last car. And, you know, we, we know they worked well. And I don't really have a class limit for turbo size. So, yeah, you could just put the biggest one they make on there. and know you're going to make a lot of horsepower, but it's not going to spool. It's not going to 60 foot well. So, you know, we just started the progression the same way we did with the engine parts uh, with precision. You know, we went to a 76, 80. 
And one thing that I've learned very well from Job and Jay is pressure ratio of the engine, manifold pressure to back pressure to keeping the engine happy and keeping the engine efficient. So, you know, we tune the car off of pressure ratio and we watch the pressure ratio. And when that starts to cross the one to one, that's when it's like, okay, we're going to need a bigger turbocharger before we add more manifold pressure and then see if we can spool it. And funny enough, the spooling is still not an issue. We're, you know, we're up to 83, 85s. And right now, Precision is building us some 86, 85s because it's just been fine. The converter combo with the engine speed we can leave at, you know, we're still we're still within our realm. Okay, cool. Uh, you just brought up another term that I want to dive into, which is pressure ratio. Again, something that's reasonably easy to overlook, which is the ratio between the inlet manifold pressure, essentially the boost pressure being fed into the engine. Uh, but the easy part to overlook with turbochargers is that we're going to end up with exhaust back pressure. That turbine housing and turbine wheel is actually creating a significant restriction to the exhaust gas flow. And that ratio really has so much impact on the performance of the engine, but also the boost response. You know, if we want a turbocharged streetcar that's going to give good response at low RPM, then we might see those pressure ratios in the range of sort of two to one, maybe two and a half to one, where the exhaust pressure is higher than the inlet manifold pressure. On the flip side of that, with drag cars, if we get it down to the point where the exhaust back pressure is below uh, the inlet manifold pressure, just you sort of see the performance start to, in terms of horsepower, start to ramp up. The engine, I, I kind of put it down to almost starts acting a bit like a naturally aspirated engine. We can also run more aggressive cam profiles. So that's what you're talking about to the one to one ratio there. You're actually targeting, trying to target below exhaust manifold pressure, below inlet manifold pressure. Yep, exactly. And and like you said, you know, we don't we don't necessarily care about the street aspect or, you know, as long as it will spool on the starting line, you know, it's going to race fine down the track. So we just want it to make the most efficient horsepower it can, which is going to be a lower pressure ratio. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing you just I mean, might have alluded to, but I may have got a wrong read on it. Uh, you can actually use pressure ratio as the load axis for your volumetric efficiency or fuel and ignition tables. Are you doing that? It just sounded like maybe you are. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, so that kind of then, I guess, almost self-corrects for some of those changes from a tuning side in terms of just keeping our air fuel ratio on track when your density altitude changes as well, doesn't it? Yeah, from a tuning side, you know, the way Job approached it and the way we tune the car, it will, yes, the density altitude affects like air fuel ratio, like our car, like it's fine. It's not going to affect it at all. It's only, you know, going to maybe make a little more horsepower because it's better air or not. But air fuel standpoint, you know, we don't have to touch the tune because it's going to be pressure ratio based. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, one other strategy I wanted to talk a little bit about is traction control. And that's a bit of a misnomer sometimes when we talk about drag racing. Often, actually, traction control based on wheel speed is is illegal. Uh, I'm not actually sure about uh, the rules for the class you're racing in. But then it also comes to be a little bit problematic when you've got the front wheels in the air for a significant portion of the launch. So how are you doing traction control if you're using it at all? Yeah, so we're using the you know the native traction control that comes uh, in the Motec. We're using two systems, which is the drive shaft speed control and then the front wheel versus rear wheel slip percentage. And what we do is transfer from the drive shaft speed control to the front wheel versus rear wheel at a certain mile per hour where we know the front end is down and the car's going down the racetrack. And we use this system in the same sense that we use the wheelie control system as it's a safety net. So, you know, if we miss a tune up, if something is on the track, you know, it's going to catch the tire, catch the, catch the engine more than the tire. So the real problem is if you spin the, the most crucial part of a drag pass is like 0.8 seconds on the run. So it's when the converter starts clamping down on the engine, all the power starts getting pushed to the rear tire. You know, that's more than likely where you're going to see 90% of the car spin. That's the zone it's going to spin. When it does come off the tire, the radial tire isn't like a slick tire. So the compound, it's either hooked up 100% or it's not hooked up 100%. It can't have wheel speed and continue to gain traction. So when you lose that tire at 0.8, you know, and, you're, and your, your engine speeds, you know, at, at 7,000 RPM, and your wheel speeds at 20 miles per hour, what's going to happen is the tire, the engine's going to zing towards the rev limiter. The wheel speed is going to be 100 plus mile per hour, whatever the maximum is in that gear. And then you have to wait for the tire to slow back down before you can then accelerate again. Otherwise, it's going to keep spinning. 
And by then, two seconds have passed and the other car's down the racetrack. Where the drive shaft slope will catch, it'll catch the wheel speed before you even know what's happening. You can, you can see it in the data. As soon as that comes, you know, it manages the power. It allows you to then pedal the car if you need to or start accelerating again. Your run's not going to be as fast as it would be if you didn't have wheel speed, but it's not, you're not just going to sit there waiting for the tires to slow down to accelerate again. You could still potentially beat the guy next to you in that pass because you're going to be able to start again sooner. Yeah. So a key aspect here is that on a good pass, on a good track, you shouldn't be on that traction control. It's there as a safety backstop just in case you break out into wheel spin. Absolutely. And and the drive shaft slope is you have to put in a predetermined slope. So with that in place, you can never go faster than what you put in. So like your power range to your slope still need to be really close you know it's not just like oh it has traction control it works and then of course that still needs to be tuned with the amount of power reduction to the power ramp in so it's not the voodoo system as a lot of people think it still requires a lot of work once once it's in place but it will absolutely save a run and make a better race car. yeah uh, i think i kind of consider that to be a passive form of of traction control because like you say you have to tell it what the profile of the drive shaft speed versus time is for a really really good pass it can't fill that data in by itself and then I guess the other aspect is as you develop the car and it becomes faster or you've got more traction then you're going to need to also adapt that drive shaft speed profile because otherwise it becomes self-limiting but then you transfer across to this wheel speed based control strategy and that's what I'd sort of call a more more active control strategy where it's purely just looking for a slip target and once you're beyond that it's going to bring in some kind of intervention. Right, absolutely. And you know, in down track like on a radio car once once it's hooked up and you're you're out 100 feet, it may spin a little on the gear change when there's a big interruption in power or engine speed. But after that, the car's going to be pretty hooked up unless there's something on the racetrack. So again, it's it's a safety net like you know, it works so good. Like I feel confident in this car. Like it's never just going to turn sideways at a thousand feet unless there's, you know, something has gone really wrong. Like, it's, you know, that system in place just, it makes you feel safer as a driver and, you know, keeps the car safer for a pass. Now you just talked about uh, on the gear shifts and earlier you talked about using some ignition retard on the shift. So one of the things, and we'll talk about this transmission in a bit of detail shortly, but one of the things with a manual gearbox, maybe a, a Liberty or G4, something like that, is that they can really unsettle the car on the shifts because they're clutchless, you're just pulling the next gear and obviously the engine RPM has to be pulled down and that can have the effect of sort of spiking the, the rear wheel speed and you know quite often see very high powered manual transmission cars get very squirrely on the gear shifts. The auto is a bit smoother but I mean there's still no magic here. So are you using that ignition retard just to soften that that shift and, and keep the car hooked up through the shift? Right, exactly. And you know that's going to determine on your, your gear ratio splits in your transmission. Uh, you know, everyone, you know, between your first and second and third gear to your rear gear, your RPM drop is going to be tuned in a little differently. The more speeds you have, the less drop you're going to have. So the less chance you have into that. But if you have a really tight converter and a big gear ratio difference, then yeah, you're going to definitely be prone to wheel speed on the on the one, two shift specifically. Yeah, okay. Uh, so getting into the details of that transmission, what have you got in there? Obviously a three speed you just mentioned. Yeah, so it's a three speed Mark Mickey, which is M&M transmission built. It's a close ratio transmission, uh, meaning that first and second gear you know, third gear is always one to one in these transmissions, but the first to second gear ratios are close, so you don't have the big splits like we just talked about. Yeah, okay. Advantage with having that third gear over the likes of the Power Glide, which is kind of the other popular go to for a drag racing automatic transmission? Yeah, so I owned a Power Glide in my last car before I bought a Turbo 400, and I think the main advantage is the initial cost. You can build a power glide for 2000 horsepower for probably half the price you can build a turbo 400 for 2000 horsepower once you get above that 2000 horsepower mark there's not a lot of power glides that will support that power but a lot of people will race a two-speed turbo 400 which uses the you know the main shafts and stuff of 400 but only has two forward gears that's going to be combo specific what i've learned from jay who you know has raced a lot of smaller engines than even that i'm racing is you know the more forward gears you have the better for the engine that's going to be because it's going to keep it in the revs you don't have as much grunt or as much torque as you would in a larger engine to be able to pull through just two speeds 
and you know the car will be faster which in turn it has uh, proven true yeah i sort of saw during my time with drag racing a lot of the yeah, my experience is almost solely uh based around the import stuff but everyone started with manual transmissions and then due to some of the problems I just mentioned, we started to see the fast guys all transfer across to, to autos, and that's now the way to go, particularly if you want to go fast in something like a, a Nissan GTR, for example. With this, though, the torque converter typically is going to have some amount of slip, so that means that sometimes your mile an hour, for example, is going to suffer compared to all things being equal with a, a manual transmission and a clutch. Can you talk to us about the converter, converter slip, and, and what sort of how relevant that that is what you can do to control it or limit it. Yeah, so the torque converter in a in a drag car is probably one of the most important pieces of that puzzle. And tuning the torque converter to your specific car, depending on what your gear ratios are, your your shift RPM, your final RPM, and the car's weight is going to very very uh, be different from car to car. My transmission is lockup version of the Turbo 400, so the torque converter has a clutch in it. So we're able to, you know, engage the clutch and achieve zero slip on command. So much more efficiency, right? So down track slip, you know, isn't a concern to us because we can lock the converter and then do that. What that does is, you know, before the lockup, you know, became as popular as it is now, or even guys that still haven't gone to the lockup because of the expense of that transmission and converter over the other is you end up with a really tight torque converter that you try to loosen up artificially in the beginning half of the racetrack with staged dumps where you're relieving pressure to the converter to make it more loose because there's not as much fluid in it and then let it you know close those dumps as you go down the track to tighten the converter up you know where we still monitor converter pressure and we still tune off converter pressure you know for the first 100 feet or so but with the lockup we're able to get away with a you know a looser converter to help spooling and the and the other aspects because we can achieve zero slip when we want. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How are you controlling that lockup? And can you give us a, an idea? I don't know if this is sort of a secret squirrel IP, but yeah, you know, on how you're engaging that and where. Yeah. So anyone that's listened to the car run again, you know, in the past year or so, can tell that you know it's making uh, what sounds like gear changes more than more than two times to make three speeds. And that is our lockup strategy, which, you know, is all done through the MoTeC and, you know, we're using it in each gear for a certain amount of time to bring the engine down to accelerate to simulate a higher speed transmission. Okay. All right. It sounds like almost the best of both worlds. You've got the torque converter, the automatic transmission to soften those shifts and keep the car hooked up, but still zero slip through the, the deep end of the track. So all of the mile an hour and all of the power is making its way to the wheels. Right, absolutely. And with the zero slip, what that allows you to do is to run more gear ratio in your final gear ratio, which another advantage to the small engine and the high revs in the zero slip is that, you know, we can run considerably higher rear gear ratio, which is, you know, free torque, which, you know, horsepower comes from torque. So the more the more torque you can have through gear reduction, the more you know power you're going to actually put to the surface. Yeah, no, that makes a lot, makes a lot of sense. Uh, a question I, I haven't asked so far, but with the requirements for the drag drive uh, style of racing, how much faster do you think the car would be if it was a dedicated drag car? You didn't need the, the cooling system, etc. So I think the car, the main advantage would be the car's weight. So we could, you know, like right now we just, we run a 12 volt battery system with the factory alternator. So like the alternator's 22 pounds. I would still run water. I'd run water in the heads, but I would probably just do like a pressurized tank and not, you know, the full radiator. And I want to have the capacity that it has now. So, you know, there's weight in that. My fuel cell is in the back of the car now, which is an eight gallon cell. The mechanical pump is in the back of the car. So there's a cable drive from the oil pump to the back. Like that, that cable's 18 pounds. You know, I can add up 150 pounds without even getting into it pretty far. So, so mainly, if I'm still running that same engine, you know, if I wanted to go a billet block because I'm not doing drag and drive, now we're talking more horsepower, but just like in a direct changeover from how I race the car now, if I didn't have to drive it would just be a, the weight advantage, which, you know, at this stage would be considerably faster with 150 pounds out of it or whatever that number may be. Obviously, sort of putting on the spot here, and I know this, it's not sort of a, a set in stone number, but if you take 150 pounds out of a car that's running 626, you know, what sort of a difference in ET would you expect from that 150 pound drop? You know, I don't know exactly because I haven't 
done it, you know, with with a car that fast. But I have taken a hundred pounds out of this car since I've owned it from when I first started racing it to now. You know, we've been slowly increasing power, but I, I know for a fact that it gets easier the lighter it gets, you know. Like we were when we first started racing this car, it was three thousand fifty with me in it. And, you know, now it's getting closer to, to twenty nine hundred, it's twenty nine thirty or so. You know, and it just get it, it gets faster. I see it in the shock settings. Like I take ten pounds out of the back, and you know, I have to click the shocks two or three times because they're reacting faster. So the weight at this power level and at and at this ET range drastically seems to affect what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I guess the lighter the car is, the easier it's going to be on all of the componentry as well. One more uh, question I had, you just mentioned a 12 volt battery system, which most people wouldn't give too much thought to. Every car has a a 12 volt system where we've got a 12 volt battery and an alternator that is run off the engine and charges that battery. And again, for the drag and drive, you need this because you can't run a total loss charging system or battery. With a lot of drag cars, we see them using a 16 volt battery battery and no alternator and is that just for what you mentioned there the the weight saving of not having the alternator yeah mainly it's going to be the weight saving of the alternator and you couldn't run a total off system off a 12 volt battery because they don't have the capacity or the amp hours to to make it through the run there are companies that make 16 volt alternators if we wanted to run a 16 volt system which you know would give coils and injectors uh, more energy to run but my problem with that is the complexity and the failure rate of these components. You know, me being able to run a factory alternator, you know, I have one in the trailer just in case, but like I've never had one fail, you know, and, and it maintains a solid like 14.9 volts through the run. So, you know, I don't feel like I'm far away from that 16 volt range and I don't have any ignition problems or anything like that. So I'll, I'll keep rocking that as long as I can. Yeah, no, fair enough. Again, another case of if it's not broken, no need to fix it. That point that you mentioned, though, as well, having that higher voltage to the coils and maybe to a lesser extent the injectors, uh, particularly with these high boost engines, uh, ignition energy is is everything to get that fuel air charge lit off. So more voltage to the coils means more energy out of the coils, providing the coil is happy running at 16 volts, of course. Sure, sure. All right, Brett, uh, I think we'll move towards wrapping this up. It's been a a great chat and great to get some insight into the car. We've got the same three questions we ask all of our guests to wrap up. And the first of those is what's next in the future for you and the car? Well, what's next for the future for me is just started in the past week. I've started a new job position with Motion Raceworks as a business development manager for all companies, which is Rife Sensors, Fluid Works, and TBM Brakes. So this is my first time of stepping out of the workshop as the full-time gig and, you know, moving into parts development and the, you know, solely technical side of the aftermarket to be able to help consumers and to help grow these brands uh, with this company. So, you know, I've been really, really excited for that. And, you know, Doug and the company, you know, I've been working with them for years as far as I've been running Rife sensors on my car since I built it. You know, they've been a sponsor of mine and stuff like that. And I've been testing parts for them and different things for them throughout the last, you know, couple of years. So to be able to move there full time and, and to pursue this is, is going to be a, a neat next step to my journey of uh, racing and my personal side. Yeah, definitely. Sounds like a really exciting opportunity. Yep. And then uh, as far as the car goes, the next step, the next step coming up right now in two weeks is uh, TX2K, which, you know, we have a good shot of winning that race, which, you know, the car's pretty fast right now in the arena that we race it. So you know, we show up and we just try to keep our heads down, do our thing, keep the car together and not make any mistakes. And, you know, we have a, we have a pretty good shot of doing well there. Evolution of the car. We'll see where it goes for the next year. I think as of right now, chassis wise, the car is, is set. There's not a lot of areas I can improve that. There's not there's nowhere else I can take weight out of it. So we'll slowly try to make more horsepower. And then, you know, the car will get faster that way. I mean, on paper, a 626 sounds dangerously close to a 599, which I'm guessing must be somewhere on your radar. The reality, of course, is uh, getting two and a half tenths out of a car that's already running low sixes is no mean feat. There's, There's a lot of work. It becomes iteratively more difficult to go faster. But the question here is, is a five second pass on your radar? Not at all. Okay. It's not on my radar at all. I know, well, it's also just not how I go about it, right? So we, we went 626, we we saw the data later last week, that 626 went 412 to the eighth. Last week we went 410 to the eighth and we know we can go 408 or so in this gearing 
you know, which will translate to a 618 or so, but we're still a lot of horsepower away from that five number. So until it goes 618, can it go 608 and then 605? Like there's a lot of steps, you know, to get that at five second round. Like I, it would probably take another 500 horsepower just to try to muscle that down the track, which is just going to bring up a lot of other new problems. Well, then you start facing traction issues and, you know, mechanical strength issues and, yeah, the whole thing starts to just become more and more difficult. I'm glad you did mention the the additional 500 horsepower because, again, people who aren't deep in the world of drag racing would see that number and go, oh, so a, a five's just around the corner. The, the reality can be something very different, though. Right, yeah, exactly. My next goal wouldn't be a five. My next, like, you know, goal in the back of my head for the car, which, you know, it doesn't really mean anything other than that, you know, we get to that small achievement for ourselves is actually to go like a 399 to the eighth in eighth mile trim. So I have a, you know, eighth mile gear set that I put in the transmission in the rear end, you know, to make it more suited for eighth mile racing. And after Texas, I think we're going to put that in there and, and, and go, go swinging for it a little bit. We don't get to go out time slipping with the car much because most of the time we're at races and like we talked about like you know i'm not necessarily trying to go for personal best at the race so if we can go out to a rental and just try to go faster it's some of the most fun we have with the car actually yeah no that's fair I and mean, that the risk i suppose when you're actually racing and trying to win is if you really push for a pb you can potentially end up throwing a pass away because you overpower the track or something correct yeah absolutely yeah i've never put a tune up in the car that we haven't been there yet as far as ET range, unless we have to. So unless we line up next to someone that we know has been faster than us, you know, and even then it's going to be incrementally faster. It's not going to be a big swing. And then um, we just do our job well and try to win. So no Hail Mary tunes being thrown in it, just iterative gains in a known quantity and a known, a known ET. Well, yeah. And, and because like, you know, like, oh, you're going to turn it up next pass. And like the, the fact of the matter is it's up every pass. Like, you know, it's a 300 cubic inch, you know, factory casting engine going 227. Like there's not like you can't just put 10 pounds of boost in it. It's going to explode and catch on fire, you know, so it's not, you know, Hail Mary is just dangerous. So it's not even worth it. Absolutely. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, is there any advice you'd give to one of uh, our listeners or a younger version of yourself to maybe help fast track where you've got to in your career? And I mean, you're a unique sort of guest here in that you're not necessarily running a business building race cars. You, your race car is a personal thing. But I mean, yeah, give us give us your impression of that. Well, I think it's to try to latch on to someone that you look up to in a sense that, you know, is already kind of there that can fast track you to, um, you know, teach you things and to be re- receptive of those things. So you don't have to necessarily learn the hard way. And, that uh, you know, this, this hobby or this sport gets, you know, it's expensive. And if you can't afford to do it the right way, and then you, you take a shortcut and then you have a failure and now you're set back that investment of that of the shortcut and you still can't afford to do it the right way and it just you know you get you get you know bummed out and and it, and it was really hard on you so i would you know i would try to build the car or or find the person that's going to do a good job for you and try not to take you know a lot of shortcuts because the shortcuts will just you know make not a good memory for that situation and you'll be in a worse spot than you were if you didn't do it at all. Yeah, I think that's really solid advice. Uh, there's a saying that I'm probably going to butcher at something along the lines of, if you can't afford to do it right the first time, how are you going to afford to to redo it a, a second time to fix it? And, you know, that, that's um, often a, a, a learning curve that you have to learn the hard way. But, uh, yeah, really important advice. I think your point about a, a mentor essentially as well, we don't need to necessarily go and reinvent the wheel and learn all of this knowledge from scratch. I mean, there are, it's all been done before. We're pretty much not paving the way with anything really groundbreaking. Sure, the technology on the cars continues to evolve, but we're still doing the same thing just with different tools. And you know, thousands of people have walked before us. So if we can lean on their experience and fast track our own knowledge, then happy days, I think. Yeah, absolutely. All right, last question for today. If people want to follow you, see what you're up to, uh, how they're best to do that. So all my stuff is linked to my name, so it's pretty easy to find. Facebook, Instagram, uh, it's just Brett LaSala. If you search that, um, you'll see a green Mustang more than likely pop up in a picture, and that's going to be me. I do have a small YouTube channel that I've made some videos about my car with over the past year. 
and again, um, search Bradley Fowler and you can find that. We'll, uh, as usual, put links to those accounts in the show notes to make it super easy for people to find. I did do a fair bit of stalking on your YouTube channel prior to this interview. I'd have to say it's excellent. Uh, you speak really well on camera. Uh, the editing and the video work is also exceptional. And I, for one, found it really interesting. So I would urge our listeners, if they do want to uh, learn a little bit more and see and hear this car in action, because obviously a podcast's a pretty limiting uh, media format for that, uh, then yeah, go check out that YouTube channel. All right, thanks, Brett. Really interesting chat. Uh, Great to learn something about a platform that I am not overly familiar with. And uh, we look forward to seeing your progress in the future. All right, thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of Tune In with Brett LaSala, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience, and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt free of charge anywhere in the world. This is also a great place to ask any questions you might have too, and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week, a big shout out to VTech Justin from the United States who has said, like cars, like technical details, this one's for you. Simply a great platform, great hosts, guests and professional execution. This is not the horse around podcast, it's knowledge and serious business podcast. Great details, content and knowledge galore. Well, thanks for the kind words there. Great to hear that you're seeing so much value in our podcast. And if you get in touch with your t-shirt size and shipping details, we'll get a fresh t-shipped straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can re-watch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code podcast75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.